Greetings from your host in the house, Rochelle Potkar. Every other time, I will bring to you stories and poetry from my pen. Today, the story I will be sharing is called The Family. The season couldn't be ascertained. It could have been a warm day in winter or a cold day in spring. It was certainly a holiday because his whole family, wife Bertha and children Clive and Samantha were in the drawing room watching TV. But as he sat with them, a sinister feeling drew toward Richie, like a premonition of doom sweeping up from the lake and through the driveway right up to their doorsteps. Richie looked around. The fish in the aquarium quivered and flitted. Their black Labrador Roger whimpered. Usually children have better psychic ability, but Clive and Samantha were busy in the flickering screen of Toy Story 3. Richie had recurring nightmares himself, mostly speech-filled. Some voice telling him to kill his wife, his children, break things around the house or get possessed like a vampire or ghost or to drink his wife's blood. He attributed these to late-night movie watching. He loved horror, action, ghost movies and they were surely permeating into his psyche. He would wake up screaming into the night, slashing his arms like swords at an invisible voice until it stopped. Then things would turn normal. But just for a while. Again the voices would haunt him. Now Richie couldn't remember anything from that night before. Yet he was pensive. Bertha too was sipping from her glass of water, if not cracking her fingers. The trees swayed rowdily outside their large windows. Richie paced about the room, squinting at the porch, the driveway, the road, the steely glint of the lake with Roger close at heels. Switch on the news channel, he said suddenly. Maybe an earthquake's hit some place, a bomb blast somewhere, Mm, a terrorist attack. Maybe Nana or Grandad has passed away or one of our friends is in trouble. Some harm has come to someone. Yes, I have been feeling the same since five this morning, said Bertha, nodding as a mop of girls danced around. I had a frightening dream. It looked like I would be taken away from... She hesitated in saying, you. Richie sat down. I heard these words again and again in my dream. Kill them, kill them. Move on, lazy person. Did you also hear a voice in your dream, Bert? Bertha went into a daydream. She was always vague and that's what Richie hated. Her dreaminess made her vulnerable and sweet but sometimes when the occasion was urgent, idiotic and empty-headed, like now. I'm sure, said Bertha. I heard a voice saying, blood, gore, horror, chainsaw massacre. I have no clue who was saying this. Was it inside my head? Was somebody whispering near me? I thought it was you. Should we call for help? She shrugged. Do we know anyone here? Frowned Richie. Bertha reached the end of the long sofa and fished out a directory. She skimmed through it, then scratched her head, saying, What is this place called? Richie blinked. He thought he knew it, but he couldn't remember now. How can we not know where we are? What's happening? He didn't want to say anything aloud. Bertha would panic. But Richie felt like they lived each day in a different city, a different country. When he had woken up last Thursday and opened the main door for a morning walk, he found himself in the tropical heat of a noisy street. Vendors yelling, pushing tomato and vegetable carts, hailing buyers from apartment buildings. Was it India? The next morning as he set out, he was on a grey road with neat buildings on either side that reflected the sun on their tinting pails. A canal ran through the centre of this grey city. Was it Europe? 
Now suddenly he felt this was London or America. The only way to sort it out was to go to the street and read its sign. I will be back, he said. Bertha kept aside the telephone directory. What if something is waiting for us out there? Like what? said Richie, a bit diffident now. Wild dogs, beasts, bears, c- crocodiles or, or dinosaurs? Get a hold of yourself, Bert. It can't be that dangerous. Just because we don't know where we are. Listen, let's restrict our imaginations for our own sake. Bertha nodded. Should I come along? No. Stay here and look after them. Richie looked at the kids. He couldn't remember their ages. Six and five? The dog was six months old. He realized he remembered some things and forgot a lot of other things. When he stepped out, cold breeze slapped his face. This has to be Europe or America. I shall find out soon. In long strides, he walked down the road parallel to the lake. There were identical white bungalows alongside the road. His house was the only one of warm colours and a red tile roof with red windows and red door frames. He had to make an urgent choice. Press on memory to redeem his fears or press on imagination and find a way out of this. Memory could wait. It held the past in its womb and was anyway static and immovable. The present seemed like an empty shell. Only the future held promises and should be concentrated upon. He thought, better, the latter. He reached the end of the street, past the identical bungalows. At the cul-de-sac beyond the last house, he suddenly stopped short. A grey patch was growing in front of him, as if the earth was staring into an unfathomable darkness. It seemed like this gaping hole was yawning out and would take him into an uncontrollable abyss. His legs began to shake. This wasn't the division of night or a day-night terminator line or a dent in the street. The road hadn't caved in. A cloud hadn't fallen off the sky. So what was this large, grey, immeasurable, widening patch? It felt like the end of the world, as if this was a film set. Maybe this was a film set. Look at those clone houses, thought Richie, as he turned and walked back. He watched the lake. It was too still. Too still. Its waters hardly stirring. There was no boat on it. Was there life in it? The houses would be the best thing to explore, he thought. Neighbours were strangers in good times and friends in bad times. Maybe they were going through similar experiences. He reached a house, climbed its stairs and on the patio surveyed its bland garden ferns. When he pressed a leaf, it did not snap. It was made of plastic. He rang the doorbell. On the third bell, an old lady answered. She was hunched over a walker and had woolly hair in a strange pattern on her head. She must be seventy. May I come in, said Richie. She moved over and let him inside. Her house was empty. There was nothing in it from wall to wall. A carpet of goose flesh swept over his skin now. But just as fear returned, so did his voice. Where are we? Who are we? She shook her head. I don't know. I can't remember. She stumbled on her walker. Something's messy inside my head. I feel constipated. She pointed to her head. I have to remember a lot, but the time has not yet come. I have to wait. How long have we been here? He pressed on. Why is this house empty? She looked into his eyes searching for something. I don't know. I have no idea. Her eyes were the most unnatural blue, as if her retinas had been busted through a glass factory. Richie moved away. 
He ran out of the woman's house and was back on the road. The road grew longer and longer. He broke into a run. He ran faster as the road beneath him expanded. This was a nightmare. He could wake up now. Did nightmares break at their most vulnerable points? By the time he reached his house, he was out of breath. He heard Bertha screams. He tried opening the main door. He searched his pockets for a phone, a gun, a car key, nothing. Her screams were growing louder and louder. He ran to the garden and tried entering through the windows, but all of them were jammed. Finally, at Bertha's loudest shrieks, a window pane in the kitchen gave way and Richie got inside. He dashed into the drawing room. Bertha was being flung around by an invisible force so strong that she hurtled past the walls. Her head slammed and blood oozed from her forehead. Richie leapt, he scrambled over and pulled her into a protective embrace. Then the walls stopped shuddering and the house grew still. Objects descended into their gravity. Bertha hugged Richie. and with a dust cloth he clamped her bleeding head where are the children in the bedroom i had secured them there is this an earthquake a demonic possession they rushed into the children's room richi found them huddled in a corner they ran into their parents arms we are not giving up on this said richi we will fight it with all our strength samantha and clive looked at him They nodded amidst their tears. Right, Pa. Let's get the house in order first, he said, clenching his jaws. All of them straightened chairs, lifted objects and books off the floor, adjusted cupboards and paintings and made up the beds. Roger followed them around, wagging his tail. The TV had broken. Richie would have to take it to a repair shop or buy a replacement. He summarized the other damages. a shattered vase a cracked lampshade a chipped painting the dining table had cracked edges the coffee table glass had smashed into smithereens bertha was in pain she held a hip and sat on the sofa as richie dialed for an ambulance a doctor a tv repair shop the calls were unanswered then the phone lost its dial tone This ordeal had made them hungry. They moved to the kitchen to fix food as Richie bent over the counter and cried softly. "I give up. I give up." he murmured. "What the hell is this? How do we come out of this if we don't even know what it is? Our memories stolen, our lives stolen. Who has put us here?" Leaving Bertha in the kitchen, he excused himself. I'm going to the nearby mart to get some things. I will be back soon. All right, said Bertha. I'm making some vegetable salad and pasta. He dabbed his nervous face. This time he turned to the left and ran along the unmoving lake in search of a deli or pharmacy. There were no houses here, rather a building that looked like an institution or museum, auditorium, school. or art gallery it faced the road on its left was a garden with a fountain richi was in two minds enter these large gates or hurry along again the road in front of him stretched underfoot he stopped he knew this by now he would run the road would expand taking him far and far beyond to nowhere he would get too far away from his house there would be nothing at the end of that road in most probability it would take all the time to get back he would be exhausted and when he got home something terrible would have happened to bertha samantha and clive but he could never give up hope he looked heavenward and yelled take us out of this this hell this shit hole this is not our life you see you piece of shit you have the nerve to steal the balls get us out of here give us our lives back even if i don't remember We want to live not die you piece of shit not like this. He screamed into the distance at the garden with the fountain at the peaceful sky with not a cloud in it. He stood in front of the large building but knew it was dead uninhabited. He was better home. When he reached home the house was quiet an avalanche of dread 
hit him. He waded through that quiet. In the kitchen, the salad bowl was smashed and in the center of the counter, bits of green vegetable floated in recently whipped cream. There was no one around. Bertha? Samantha? Clive? He called, checking each room. Storeroom, basement, swimming pool, garage. He ascended the staircase. Roger, who had crouched in fright, sprang up and ran towards him. The dog's eyes were wet. Where are they? The dog whimpered. It followed him through the children's room, extra bedroom and bathroom. Nothing. Nobody. Nowhere. Richie was paralyzed with fear. He felt helpless. What was happening? Where were they? There were no traces of struggle. Not one thing out of place. Yet three people had vanished. Soon he was sure he or the dog would be gone. He slumped on the floor and the dog sank beside him. It rested its head in his lap. I hate this. I give up. Then a thought struck. Maybe this was a reality TV. And people were watching him and entertaining themselves with popcorn and fries right now. Richie couldn't remember signing on to anything, but maybe they put him on a memory loss program. Or he was unwell, suffering from something. Could this be a life in limbo? He looked at the ceilings, walls, curtains for hidden cameras. I give up, he announced. I'm defeated. Take me out of here. I'm done with this. I resign. I'm done. I give up. He threw his hands into the air. When nothing changed or moved, he exfeciated into the hopelessness of it all. When he woke up, he knew time had passed. A lot of it. He had trouble remembering his name or that there was a dog. But he remembered the view outside the window. It was bleak winter the last time. Now trees were shedding their leaves. The lane was a thick carpet of dry orange. No one would sweep this lane. There was no one. He felt the beard over his face, the wrinkled skin of his hands. He looked into the mirror. How long was he asleep? How long? He didn't seem old, but at least a year or two had passed. He now remembered his wife and children, but not their names. Just the feeling of love, of them being there, of their hopes and dreams for a good, cherished, fulfilling life. He sat on the bed, staring at the ceiling. He looked at his favourite bookshelf and all the dog-eared books he had read, thumbing them page after page in hunger and delight. He remembered the solace and companionship they had gifted him. At some point he heard noises from the floor below, some movement and some shuffling. He didn't care any longer, even if death was awaiting him. He stood up and dragged himself into the bathroom. With a rusted razor, he shaved. With a wilted brush, he cleaned his teeth. He showered and changed into the only set of limp, smelly clothes hanging on a peg. He felt anew. He moved out of his room and descended into the lower part of the house. The lights had gone dead. Richie could trace a human shape in the dimness. This person was sitting, as if waiting for him. The only working lamp's faint light rained over his back but kept his face in the dark. He should have been petrified by now, but he was beyond all that. Let the devil eat me, he thought. If it's a beast, let it get me. I no longer wish to fight. Who is there to live for? He used to be a dog. I don't even remember his name, but he too isn't around. Richie took a few steps into the darkness and slunk into the sofa facing the figure, sitting as still, watching and waiting. Suddenly the figure grew a voice. 
Richie, are you there? Yes, who are you? Greg George Samaritan. Richie waited. I have wanted to talk to you for a while now, said Greg. I am happy you finally decided to meet me. If you wanted to talk, you never told me that. I received no mail, letter or news, said Richie. All right, that's my mistake. But can we now at least talk? Sure, said Richie. Are you angry with me? <laughs> Richie scoffed. First tell me who you are. Where's my family? Are you the one who put us through this? He was feeling murderous now. Greg switched on another lamp and Richie was taken aback. He had given up on ever seeing another person in his life. But the man in front was young. Around 17. Scrawny, dressed in a loose, faded t-shirt. He had the same beard that Richie had just shaved off from his face. I am a writer. I am trying to write a horror story. You know, a novel. I have been trying to write you into a horror novel, but... But what? You just don't let me. What do you mean? Am I an actor? Have you signed a contract? How did you come to know of me? I created you, dude. I wrote your biography. You are an inspiration for my dad, an uncle, a neighbor, all mixed up as one. I'm trying to write a story with you and your family. Family? Yeah, Bertha, Samantha, Clive. Richie, you turned out too good with too much depth for a simple, brutal horror story. I missed my deadline. I lost out on a big publication contract. Because of me? Well, I just can't say that. But yes, if you had cooperated, I would have written a decent novel. I had all things in place. The chapter outlines, the beginning, middle, end. But all that I did, you undid. You misbehaved mysteriously. I had no choice but to shut down this project. I wrote other stories with Bertha, Samantha, Clive. Now, I'm pretty happy with my oeuvre. I've come back to check on you one last time. To see if I could work you into another story. Is it ever going to be possible to write a horror story with you? Can we try working things out together one last time? Bertha, Samantha, Clive are with you? Richie asked, shocked, stunned and surprised. Yes, and they have a new man, husband, father. They are doing great. We created a successful novel. It's called I Don't Care. I hate horror stories, said Richie. The cheap thrills, shrills, yells and go. I would never want to be a part of something like that. Then you should have told me. You should have asked. Greg stared at him. What are you interested in? A family story of love, forgiveness, friendship, nostalgia. You mean drama. Whatever you call it. Look, I'm not into writing such stories. So I've decided to close down this project. It's not taking me anywhere. Richie stiffened. So because of this you are going to destroy me? I have no choice. I have to move on clear disk space. But it was fun knowing you, dude. Rich. I wish I could work with you someday. But you are a difficult person. Hardly a people's person. I didn't impose a script on you. I wrote one for you with your consultation. But you grew into your own. Too individualistic, too independent. A character needs to be understanding, malleable. It needs to bow down to the needs of the script, to the whims of the writer. You can't be your own person with free will and whim. What did you think this was? Heaven? <laughs> this is life. I think it's those books you read. Those are to be blamed. You got too much gravitas. You wouldn't suit any of my stories. But you don't worry. It will be painless. Give me back my family. In one angry sweep, Richie leapt and grabbed Greg's throat and throttled it. Greg choked, coughed and got out of breath. I need them. I'm worried about them, said Richie, gritting his teeth. It hurts. Do you understand? It hurts. You have tortured me so much. I want my Bertha, Samantha, Clive right now. He loosened the grip over Greg's throat. 
Just then Greg punched him hard. Richie's nose cracked and he fell onto the sofa. Could I be given another chance? He blabbered and blood and tears from his face. Another story? I still don't like horror. But maybe another writer can do me justice. Richie joined his palms. Not sure if he should fight for his life that was so barren and lifeless or for his family. But if he lived, he could have his family back too. There was hope out somewhere. We don't transfer our creations, said Greg. We don't have the time, patience, energy. Besides, you are treacherous, dude. I can understand your demand but cannot live with it. In no time, in no time, you will overtake your destiny and God alone knows do what. Greg stood up and was gone in a flash. Richie watched him through an ebbing headache. Yeah, he did read a lot. He remembered all the books of his spare time when he was at intervals between working at the flanks of the stage of a page. Those books had informed him, made him a person, a thinker, far more than anyone could have imagined. There was a gift, a strength that came from reflecting deeply. Then he heard the click as if a light had been switched off. The house around plunged into darkness. Then another click like from a keyboard and the family. If you still haven't read my book of short stories, Bombay Hangovers, head to Amazon. You are invited to drop your review comments on Goodreads and Amazon. I would love to know your thoughts. See ya next week then. Signing off, your host and dost, Rochelle Potkar.